of the men that we have relied upon over the course of the last few months, probably years actually, uh, to tell us what is really going on. A uh, man who knows a thing or two about statistics, used to work at the Office for National Statistics, Jamie Jenkins, independent statistician, uh, a man who can um, see the wood for the trees. Let's find out what he knows. Jamie, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Mike. I'll probably have to come up with a new topic to talk to you. <laughs> Hopefully. But I think on Boris, I think he's probably played a blind to you, Mike, because this police investigation probably means Starmer tomorrow, if he starts asking him questions about it, he will he'll probably just respond and say, I can't answer any questions because there's a police there's investigation. There's a police investigation. Well, exactly. But, I mean, it's all very well to say he's played a blinder and that this is a work of genius. But, I mean, <laughs> there are some who might suggest that there's a little bit of a, a stink about it. If he's able to ring up the head of the Metropolitan Police and say, oi, you better start investigating me so that I can't do anything else until it's finished. And how long is it going to take? Or how long is the piece? How long do you want it to take? I mean, that's kind of the conversation we think has taken place. That shouldn't really be allowed, should it? Well, no, Mike, but, you know, this is politics. And obviously Boris is... If this report was going to come out this week, this is a, a bit of a blinder to try and stop it coming out. And yeah. The police investigation, they might say, oh, it's taken a while to do... And then we'd be into the kind of March, April time. People would have forgot all about it. They'll probably come out and say there was no criminality, actually, rather than saying there was any kind of dodginess with right. the rules. And then Boris will say, well, the police have said there was no criminality. So let's get on with it. That's yeah. probably what I think will happen, Mike. But whether or not he survives that, who knows? Talk about cynical. I mean, this is possibly the most cynical thing that he's ever done. And he's done plenty of cynical manoeuvres. Um, so we shall see. We can only wait and uh, and, and hope that uh, it doesn't drag on so long that the actual government and the business of government can't be done, because that's the problem for me, is that the place is in a kind of holding pattern and has been for about the last two or three weeks. And if you're working for the Cabinet, for example, if you're a Cabinet Minister, what, what on earth are you supposed to be doing? Well, yeah, Mike, we've got that issue, because obviously with Boris kind of in limbo, the government's kind of not functioning at all. And and I suppose one of the benefits of all of these party scandals has probably meant that to keep appease the backbenchers, they're not going to try and continue with Plan B restrictions. And and, and actually, if we talk about the, probably the Plan B restrictions, Mike, I think I was on with you just before Christmas. Yeah. And we had, uh, I think I was talking to you about Neil Ferguson's model of, ooh, if we don't have any more restrictions, we get up to 5,000 deaths a day. I, I came on the show and said how much bonkers that was at the time. We then got Warwick University who work on behalf of SAGE coming up with a model that said around 3,000 deaths per day. And I think, to be frank, for the first time, Mike, uh, for a while, the government actually had a proper smell of that report. And I, I, I can't use the term that I probably should, you know, on, on air, but they looked at that report and they decided not to introduce Plan B restrictions. And, and I'll just t- tell the viewers and listeners kind of, what the model was saying is the the sage model was saying if we don't issue more restrictions beyond plan b we might get well we were predicting up to 2890 deaths a day now they they have a range on that as a lower range and an upper range the upper range was around 5000 the same as neil Ferguson, and and they were predicting that around now mike about the last week or so of january we were predicting that where are we uh we're probably more around 200 deaths a day Nowhere near 2,890. So, you're so they're out by more than a factor of 10, right? Yeah, and well, over 90% out, Mike. And, and remember now, these res- the, they were saying this is what they think will happen. Even their lower estimate uh, was way, way out, over 80% out. Mm. And that was their best case scenario. And I think, frankly now, Mike, this is a, a good example of why we should completely ignore any sage modelling in the future. If any new variants come out, they were ridiculing some people, the scientists in the UK, about what the South Africans were saying, everything they said at the time came home to roost. And uh, quite frankly, Mike, you know, in Wales and Scotland, they did go and introduce some more restrictions. Uh, and the England model, when you look at that, it, it just didn't bore out. And we've got to start considering now what the hell are we doing when we're listening to some of these scientists? Well, I mean, there's a diminishing number of them, isn't there? But they're still out there, some of them who are saying, oh, well, you know, there could be more variants coming and we don't know whether they might be more dangerous than Omicron. Um, You know, we are still very much at the peak of it all. I mean, it's quite incredible what they're coming out with. And we keep, as you keep repeating and correcting, we keep hearing as well from people like Nadeem Zahawi, I think it was just the other day, saying that, you know, 90% of people in hospital with covid are unvaccinated which of course is rubbish because what they're doing is actually redefining the term unvaccinated aren't they they're saying if you've only had one or two you're unvaccinated 
Yeah, well, Boris is talking about the unboosted now. He's mm. using that term. Yes. And Nadim Zawahi was talking about ICU yesterday and 90% are unvaccinated, which, to be frank, if you're unvaccinated, you've had no doses of the vaccine. I've been ridiculing that number for bloody months, Mike. On, on, you know, it's been going on for a, for a while on this yeah. now. And, and the true figure is December we had figures and it's about 61%. Seems quite high. But what where we are, Mike, just quickly on where, with the situation, Omicron is clearly less severe. Uh, the numbers of patients in intensive care are uh, a, kind of a lower back to the last July. So they're significantly lower, you know, 85% lower than this time last year. And not only that, Mike, half the patients in hospital now have Omicron or COVID. There might be some Delta variant still out there, but they have COVID and they're not actually in hospital because of it. They right. just happen to test positive for it. So I think it depends on what the kind of the, the, the we're talking about with this pandemic. Omicron's obviously less severe, mm. but some governments are still, fa you know, fixed on cases. Look at France now, Mike. Yeah. They've had their highest cases ever through the pandemic. I put a tweet out last night on this. This is what they've been doing over the last six weeks. And cases are four times higher than what they are here in the UK. So they've got... they've. First of all, remember they banned the UK f f travelers going in, so yes. they banned some foreigners going in. Then they closed the nightclubs. Uh, then they uh, extended the masks in classes, like we kind of did here. Mm. Then they've now introduced vaccine passes in hospitality. Uh, they've started vaccinating children down to the age of five, and they got cases that have never been so high. And then you've got Israel, Mike, on the other hand, where they've started administering fourth doses. I think in the last 24 hours, they've just approved the fourth dose for everybody over the age of 18. And on a per head basis, they're even worse than France. So, yeah. but the thing is, Mike, these are cases. If you actually look at the deaths underlying all of that, they're relatively low compared to the past. So, I think we've got to stop fixating yes. on it. Well, I was looking at one of your um, graphs, I think, from all the way back in January of last year when we had the peak that everybody was worried about. Um, and actually, there were fewer cases then than there are than there are in this January. However, um, in that time, more and more people were going to hospital, whereas now hardly anybody is. Yeah, we had, you know, the, the cases we had over the Christmas period, Mike, we've never seen them so high. And, and ONS were predicting as well, because obviously we, and not everybody gets tested. We had a lot of people being tested. They were saying we may be having kind of a half a million cases a day. And that's not a bad thing, actually, mm. if fewer people are falling ill, because, right. you know, some people are saying, Mike, this isn't kind of a natural vaccine mm. because people are catching it. It does help reduce the kind of chances of you catching it again. And, and quite frankly, Mike, we've seen kind of Sturgeon and Drake for now in the devolved nations doing their press conferences recently or or talking in first minister's questions, talking about using some ONS data, which I've been ridiculing them doing, to try and claim, oh yeah, we perform better than England. Look, uh, look at the numbers, our restrictions definitely worked. Mm. What they don't tell you, Mike, is the southwest of England, the east of England and the southeast of England performed better than Scotland and Wales. And they had exactly the same rules as other parts of England. So some parts of England came out worse, some parts of England came out better. Comparing those countries to the whole of England is, is quite highly misleading, I think. Right? And, and quite frankly, I think we can put to bed now that these extra restrictions don't do anything. And, and one thing, Mike, Mark Drakeford was on a, f a couple of weeks ago. They asked him a question about, are you going to add the booster vaccine to the vaccine pass? Right. And he came out and said, yeah, we've nearly got the technology ready to do that. So rather than considering what they're doing in Ireland to get rid of them, he's all for adding in the booster vaccine. I think now Boris is getting with them going in England. He's going to have to call his hand if the facts are quite clear there, Mike. They don't work. Time to get rid. Well, that's the thing. Um, and given now that England has done that, um, I mean, we're obviously looking north to Scotland as well and, uh, and west to Wales, if you like. I mean, surely at some point they're going to have to all agree that this is what we're going to do in the future. No, indeed, we should never have devolved this in the first place. And he was asked the question, uh, Mark Drakeford as well, Mike, about because these powers, you know, these emergency coronavirus powers come to an end in March, if that means that they elapse in Wales as well. And then he's now claiming that they've used some public health act from the 1980s, I think, because right. pushed through all this legislation in Wales. Complete power grab, just some common sense needs to prevail in all of this, Mike. We need to start moving way beyond. We talked about this last summer, didn't we? We need to move beyond kind of where we are. Thankfully, Omicron came along and is far less deadly. Yes. Well, Quite isn't it amazing as well how quickly the government can suddenly pivot 
when they feel like they need to. And suddenly there's no travel restrictions really to speak of. I mean, I know people who are unvaccinated will still say, well, there are actually on people who are unvaccinated, and that's true. But suddenly they've done away with, uh, you know, the pre-departure test. They've done away with now uh, getting a test when you come home again from wherever you've been. Uh, they've done away with um, PCRs pretty much altogether. They've done away with uh, social distancing. They've done away with masks in schools. I mean, it all happened terribly quickly. Uh, because Boris Johnson suddenly decided that uh, he might have to be a bit more popular than he wanted to be. Uh, indeed, Mike. And, and the thing on the travel, we we need some consensus because I think if you've got children now, um, children need to have been vaccinated for them to go into France. I think some of these ski trips, if they haven't been Every day they have to take a test. Yeah, or they have to do these daily tests. Now, I, I find this quite frankly bonkers, Mike, yeah. because if everybody goes to these ski resorts and they're all negative, for example then who's going to catch COVID if they're all negative? Because everybody's there who hasn't got it. Right. It's quite clear. I'll tell you an interesting fact, though, Mike. I was looking at the figures yesterday, going back to the NHS mandates and, and staff having kind of vaccines. So I looked at the, the last four weeks' figures that have been reported by the UK Health Agency who've had COVID, who've caught COVID, and they do them by vaccination status. So we, we've probably, and I looked at it for the working age population, so 18 to 59-year-olds, just because that's roughly what the age of people who'd be working in the NHS would be. And 13% of the COVID cases over the last four weeks were in the unvaccinated. And so 87% have had some form of vaccine. Mm. So it's quite clear they catch the virus. And we probably in that age group, it's around 13% of the population who are unvaccinated as well. So, yeah. you know, people are saying, and, and, I, and I've heard them on kind of Julia's show, you probably get people on as well, talking to James Well, saying, look, they've got to have the vaccine because it'll stop them kind of infecting others. Well, quite clearly it's not because if 87% no. of the cases have had doses. And remember, Mike, we've never done this for the flu vaccine. 30% of frontline NHS care uh, workers last year didn't have a flu vaccine. We've never done it in the past. No. And, and this vaccine doesn't stop you catching it or spreading it. So bonkers, Mike, bonkers. It really is. But this is the thing. I mean, these people, we were talking to Laura about this earlier, who say, well, we're not safe until we're all safe. It's like, well, you can't all be safe. It's, sorry, it's not achievable. You walk down the street, somebody could fall on you. You know, you drive a car, somebody could crash into you. You know, you can't make everybody safe from absolutely everything that happens. And, and then they make the argument, oh, yes, but these are preventable deaths, you know, these COVID deaths. Well, really, are they? If most of the deaths were actually caused by COVID to people who were already quite ill, then the COVID is simply one factor uh, in their death, isn't it? No, indeed, Mike. So I looked this morning because we get the weekly ONS figures because people are obviously saying that things have changed over time and it's killing a lot more younger people than it has in the past. Well, obviously, deaths are significantly lower. So I looked at the figures this morning. So mm. the, the latest week's published figures, again, 80% of all the deaths with COVID on the death certificate are over the age of 70. Right. Now, you know, obviously, it's tragic for these families if some of them wouldn't have died if COVID was there. But remember now, the vast majority of them have had the booster vaccine. If they did decide to go for a fourth dose soon for the vulnerable, they would have had it. So, you know, there comes a point, Mike, where trying to control everybody's lives, like masks in class and, and all this stuff, just doesn't stack up. No. And, and you've got to move beyond that, Mike. It's just yeah. No, I agree. Nonsense. I'll tell you what I have seen a lot of recently, and I don't know what you think of this or whether you've seen any evidence of it, but a lot of people, a lot of the fear mongers saying, oh, there's been an awful lot of children admitted to hospital in the last couple of weeks. We have to be so careful because they're the ones that are now getting it. They're the ones that are spreading it. What have you seen uh, on children being admitted to hospital? Yeah, Mike, so I actually did a bit of a blog on this a couple of weeks ago. So um, remember now, we've seen huge numbers of cases, a record number of cases with COVID. We've seen record number of children with COVID. And the important thing for, you, for the viewers and listeners is this is with COVID. Mm. Now. Um, so we have seen record numbers of children in hospital with COVID. But then if you've got record numbers of children with COVID in, in the population, the chances are you're going to have record number of children in school with mm. COVID, record number of everywhere. So what I did then is I've looked at the government stats on how many children are in hospital, because obviously children go in and out of hospital all of the time. And if Omicron was really severe for them, you'd expect to see far more children in hospital overall. But actually, interestingly, Mike, if you look at now versus a month ago, there's fewer children in hospital since Omicron's hit the country than before kind of Omicron. So, and, and the average discharge time, because I think one of the things you've talked about on the show, isn't it? You hear all of these stats about how many people are going in, but what about the stats of other people are coming out? Well, if you look at the discharges, mm. which we get once a month, the children are coming out uh, generally within two days, similar to what the discharge time would have been before COVID. So people are, you know, I put some tweets out on this myself. 
completely scaring parents to say that, you know, Omicron's causing serious illness and people are going into hospital. The Royal College of Pediatricians are saying, no, it's very mild. And the facts and figures are quite clear, Mike. There's no more children. In fact, there's less children in hospital in England now than there was a month ago. We just happen to be picking up a lot more of them when they test them. Uh, when they're in hospital who have COVID. Right. And they're in hospital, presumably, though, because they're pretty unwell with it, when we were told as well a long time ago that kids don't really get it badly. Well, some of them will be in hospital, you know, because of the COVID virus itself. But I think it's, it's similar to what we're seeing in the adult population as well, Mike. Just the vast majority of them have gone into hospital. I had a tweet of somebody to say that they were in for an operation, their, their child, in the Great Ormond Street Hospital. They were in for an operation, uh, no symptoms of COVID, but they tested them and they tested positive for COVID. So they were in hospital for the operation, nothing to do with COVID. But obviously, they'll be in the figures, Mike. And if you multiply that up by, and you know, the thousands of children potentially who are going in, you start seeing the figures. And the facts now, Mike, the, the daily figures that we see are very misleading now because mm. we've got so many people who have the virus who are in hospital not for it that when you see these daily death figures, it's quite clear they're over at kind of reporting now. Because remember, if you um, have COVID in the last 28 days and you fall off a cliff, you're in the COVID deaths. And in the past, that's not been so bad, but it's quite clearly a problem. Now, the hospital figures are misleading when you don't consider the 50% who are not in there. And when they say 90% of patients in hospital, in ICU, are unvaccinated, well, that's false to start with. But remember, the number of patients in ICU is coming down as well. So you could end up with five people in ICU. If four of them were unvaccinated, then the answer would be 80%. But you've got to look at the numbers as well, right. Mike. No, absolutely right. Well, it's, as ever, very illuminating to talk to you, Jamie. Thank you very much indeed. Jamie Jenkins, the independent statistician, uh, a man who keeps his finger on the pulse and also keeps everybody honest as well. Always worth following him on Twitter. Stats Jamie uh, is where you'll find him.